I'm Mo Rocca, and I'm excited to announce season four of my podcast, Mobituaries. I've got a whole new bunch of stories to share with you about the most fascinating people and things who are no longer with us. From famous figures who died on the very same day to the things I wish would die, like buffets, all that and much more. Listen to Mobituaries with Mo Rocca wherever you get your podcasts. I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support, too. That's where Ollie comes in, with their delightful, hard-working gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Greetings, everyone, everywhere. Laszlo Montgomery here with a whole new episode, as promised last time. And the subject I'd like to spend the next few hours introducing to you is one that's been requested more than a few times. And thanks to the most recent and urgent appeals to present this topic, we're going to push everything aside and showcase the history of Yunnan province. And over the next, however many episodes it takes, we'll explore Yunnan's history. And like I did with Henan, Hainan, and Taiwan, and the city of Guangzhou, we'll enjoy one more delightful and informative lap around the China history timeline, and view it this time from the vantage point of this southwestern province of China, beloved by not only its inhabitants, but expats and tourists the world over. And like with Taiwan's past history, Yunnan is also a place with a lot of ethnic minority people. 16 recognized ethnic groups in Taiwan, and 25 of the 55 non-Han Chinese ethnic minorities are in Yunnan. And like with the recent Taiwan series, I'm certainly going to include the ethnic minority people of Yunnan, but if no one objects too vociferously, the focus of the series will be wherever there's a nexus with what was transpiring up in core China throughout the dynasties. In recent years, there's been a lot of stuff on social media showing so many China nationals who chuck it all in, abandon the cities, and start anew in Yunnan. So many expats, too, have settled there and call the place home. Colin also moved back there. And I've lived vicariously through the many experiences of Yunnan residents posting on social media and on YouTube. In Luoping County in the northeast of Yunnan, on the border where the province meets both Guizhou and Guangxi, there's a mountain there called Yunshan, Mount Yun, or Cloud Mountain. During the Han Dynasty, when Yunnan was annexed by this, well, up to that time, greatest empire China had ever seen, they called the place Yunnan because it was south of this Mount Yun, Nan meaning south. But long before this place began its life as Yunnan province, it was something else. Peking man isn't the earliest evidence of human existence in China. 1.7 million years ago, give or take, I guess, was Yuanmo Man. Uncovered in 1965 on the Yunnan side of the border with Sichuan, and this discovery yielded proof of life of an early Homo erectus subspecies who lived in China. But the earliest place in Yunnan where human settlement caught on and thrived was around Lake Dian, where Kunming is today. I know we could wander way back into Neolithic times, but in this telling of Yunnan's history, let's begin with the Dian Kingdom, or Dian Culture, as it's also referred to as. The most ancient evenings of Yunnan province were in line with the histories of most other provinces in China. Civilization began adjacent to some body of water, a river, or a lake, and among the various clans, a leader arose, united everyone, and they were off and running. Early Dian culture was contemporary with the Eastern Zhou and the Han, 4th century to the start of the 2nd century BC. Lake Dian, Dian Chert, was the central location for this earliest history. Even to this day, the character Dian, along with the character Yun, of course, 
are often used as a written abbreviation for Yunnan province in all kinds of ways. For lack of any video evidence, we're once again dependent on the records of the Grand Historian to inform us of the nitty-gritty of the Dian Kingdom. According to the chapter Xinan Yi, the Yi or Nan Han people of the Southwest, Sima Qian says Dian was founded in 279 BC. This Yi term was how historians referred to these people, like barbarians. Now, don't confuse this Yi with the Yi ethnic minority group of people. Same sound, different character. Much more about them later on in the series. The genesis of Dian's story involved the warring state of Chu. Now, at this time in the 3rd century BC, Chu was locked in an epic struggle with their neighbor to the north, and this was Qin. And this wasn't just Qin, this was Qin state at the time of King Zhaoxiang. He was the very long-reigning warrior king who, well, more than anyone else, deserved the assist for the founding of the Qin dynasty. His father was King Huiwen, and his grandfather was none other than Duke Xiao, who, together with Xiangyang, got the ball rolling for Qin's revival and eventual conquest of all its rivals. Ruling in the kingdom of Chu at that time was King Qingxiang. He reigned 298 to 263 BC, and like all Chu kings, his surname was Xiong. He called for an expedition to be sent west to see if those lands were ripe for conquest or alliance. Chu was located in present-day Hubei, Hunan, central Yangtze River Basin. One of these westbound generals was named Zhuang Qiao, and after this Chu army set out, he was the first one to reach the Lake Dian region. Now, it wasn't like there was nobody there when Zhuang Qiao arrived. Other people had staked the place out for centuries or thousands of years before. And they spoke a Tibeto-Burman language. These are the Tibetan languages that are not part of the Sino-Tibetan language classification. Zhuang Qiao and his army took stock of the situation and explored the immediate surroundings. And then fate intervened, like it often does, when the war between Chu and Qin ratcheted up a notch the following year in 278 BC. King Zhaoxiang of Qin sent his army south to invade Chu. Now, Chu wouldn't fall to Qin until 223 BC, but they got rattled sufficiently enough during this war to convince Zhuangqiao to stay put in the Lake Dian area. He saw the potential of the place and decided rather than face an uncertain future in Chu, to establish a kingdom right there on the banks of Lake Dian. So over time, after the unification of China by Qin Shi Huang in 221 BC and following his fall, you had four main polities in the southwest of China. There was the Nanyue Kingdom in the south, and then to the west of Nanyue was the Dian Kingdom of Yunnan. North of Dian, was the Yelang Kingdom in Guizhou, and both Dian and Yelang were south of the former Ba and Shu states of present-day Sichuan that had long fallen to Qin. Dian had never fallen to Qin. Given the times and capabilities, Yunnan was still a bridge too far for the northern Chinese and their fast-evolving civilization. So it's only in the Western Han Dynasty where Yunnan begins to link up with everything happening in northern China. In 135 BC, during the reign of one of the most consequential of emperors, Han Wu Di, envoys were sent first to the kingdom of Nanyue in the south and Yelang in Guizhou. We know from past episodes that it would take until 111 BC to conquer the Nanyue kingdom, but Yelang's ruler opted to submit to Han and accepted Emperor Wu as their suzerain. And this ruler in Yelang was rewarded with a seal from the emperor, and this very same seal from more than 21 and a half centuries ago, presented to the king of Yelang by Emperor Wu, was dug out of the ground by archaeologists and authenticated in 2007. Then, like it always was in those ancient times, whenever new lands were conquered, a commandery, or a jin, would be set up to act as a fort 
and as a governing and administrative base. And in the case of Guizhou, Jianwei Commandery was established. Emperor Wu, Han Wu Di, he hadn't reached out to Dian yet. Yunnan was a a little farther away from the capital than Guizhou was, so it wouldn't be until later that the armies of this great conquering emperor showed up in the vicinity of Lake Dian. Part of the reason for the delay in sending an army down to Dian was that up in the north, at this time, it was all hands on deck with the Han Xiongnu Wars. This conflict dragged on from 133 B.C. and Han Wu Di's time, all the way to 89 A.D. And you remember, of course, Zhang Qian's famous journey from 138 to 125 B.C. Whilst traveling around Central Asia, Zhang Qian particularly made mention of Sichuan-made products selling for high prices in Bactria. And from this and other discoveries made by Zhang Qian, the Han court knew they were untapped riches waiting for them just beyond their borders, as well as a convenient passageway to India. If you remember from past CHP episodes on Zhang Qian and the Han Dynasty, Emperor Wu, Han Wu Di, like Eisenhower did in the 1950s with America's interstate road system, he got behind the idea of a Silk Road that would bring the world to China's front door, along with all the many benefits of commerce and cultural exchange. There wasn't just one Silk Road. Even back then, the world was too big for one single east-west route. It was a whole network of roads, and depending on where you wanted to go, that was the route you'd take. There was a whole other thing going on in the south than what they had going on west of Xinjiang and Central Asia. It's a different topography, different ethnicities, product selection. It was a different network of routes, and they were referred to as the Southwest Silk Road. There were four main Southwest Silk Roads that merchants traversed to any of the major markets of that South Asian region. One route went from Sichuan to Yunnan to India and Burma. One route connected Yunnan and Vietnam There was another one that took traders and the Buddhist faithful to and from Yunnan, Laos, Cambodia, and Thailand. But the one that ran from Yunnan to Tibet and then onward to India, that was the most famous one. I mentioned this ancient tea horse road, or Cha Ma Gu Dao, in that tea history series. Tea and horses were the main commodities that traversed this route, and that's how it got its name. Tea merchants in Puar packed up their famous tea and shipped it west to Lhasa via Dali, Lijiang, Zhongdian, Zayu, and Boami in southeast Tibet. And from there, it got passed all over the Himalayas. So in the case of all this two-way traffic between India and China and all points in between, which mostly involved commerce and religion, Yunnan acted as the hub, like Kashgar was in the northern Silk Roads. So, beginning in the Han, keep in mind, these routes get established and will serve as the main arteries, spreading a mix of everything that existed in South Asia at that time all around the region. In 122 BC, three or four envoys were sent by Han Wu Di on an embassy to Da Xia, or Bactria, in Central Asia. The embassy stopped in Dien and were warmly welcomed by the ruler there, but as far as submitting like their neighbors up in Yelang had done, Dien said, thanks but no thanks. And as we know from so many past episodes, Emperor Wu didn't like to take no for an answer. And in another campaign launched beginning in 112 BC to conquer the recalcitrant Nanyue kingdom, Dien was conquered in the process, and this was in 109 BC. So if anyone ever asks, when did Yunnan first become part of China? There's your answer. Sinocentrically speaking, that is. The Dian ruling structure was kept in place. A new commandery was created called Yizhou. And the king of Dian, for bending the knee to the Han emperor, was also given a gold seal that symbolized his authority to rule down there. And this seal, too, on December 28, 1956, was found inside Tomb 6, 
discovered as Shirjai Shan on the right bank of Lake Dien, the discovery of this seal and the thousands and thousands of other bronze artifacts uncovered there and in tombs at nearby Li Jiashan put some meat on those bones that Sima Qian left us in the records of the Grand Historian. And they also revealed the assimilation process was going on in Dien. This archaeological discovery of the Dien Kingdom didn't get as much shine and hoopla as the discoveries made at Sanxingdui and Jinsha, but it was quite a big deal when it happened. Guo Mo Ruo, in his capacity as chairman of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, was heavily involved in these discoveries around present-day Kunming. Just like the words found on Go Jin's sword that tied the 1965 discovery with the 5th century B.C. King of Yue, the Chinese characters found on this gold seal, Dian Wang Jin Yin, confirmed it belonged to the King of Dian, and between the words of the ancients and all the scholarship done on these Dian people, much has been learned and continues to be studied. In the end, these southwestern regions were divided up into four commanderies, Jianwei, Yizhou, Yuexi, and Zhangke. And this southwest region that included parts of Sichuan, Yunnan, and Guizhou, beginning in the Three Kingdoms era, began to be referred to as Nanchong. Back then, and for centuries that followed, that term Nanchong would conjure up images of dense mountains and forests, impassable terrain, mosquitoes, disease, and dangerous and warlike ethnic tribes people. And the people native to Yunnan province had more in common culturally and linguistically to everyone living south and west of them. During the Three Kingdoms period, Zhuge Liang, earning his reputation as a strategist and statesman extraordinaire, used progressive ways to pacify these people in Nanchung, and this is where the Man enter the story. There are a few theories about the origin of the Man. Most likely, they were a local indigenous tribe who made an attempt to aristocratize their clan by cloaking themselves in a little China gravitas. And they were based mostly in the northern part of Yunnan. When Zhuge Liang was reaching out to all the major clans in the 230s, looking to enlist their aid in his wars, the Tuanman became one tribe of particular consequence. And thanks to their alliance with the Shu Han kingdom, of which Zhuge Liang served as chancellor, in their battles against Cao Wei in the north, the Tuanman rose to become the next power in Yunnan. Anyway, I'm going to skip ahead a little. 263, Wei conquered Shu. In 265, Jin replaced Wei. And in 279, Jin conquered the last of the three kingdoms, Wu. And then China was unified at last. Fen jiu bi he, he jiu bi fen. But throughout all the events of the western and eastern Jin, the Tuanman down in Yunnan were left to their own devices, and they remained in power for the period of the northern and southern dynasties, maintaining relations with Jin, Liu Song, southern Qi, and northern Zhou. Although the Tuanman submitted to the Sui dynasty imperial court in 598, well, that apparently wasn't good enough, and the Tuanman were defeated in 602 during the years of conquest under Sui Emperor Yang. These various tribes in Yunnan who made up the Tuanman following their defeat at the hands of the Sui army were split up into two groups called the Bai Man and the Wu Man, the White and Black Man. Now, this isn't necessarily true, but Chinese historians claim the Bai Man became the Bai people and the Wu Man became the Yi people. And you could be sure the Bai and Yi people also have their own versions about their origins. What followed the Sui conquest of Yunnan were years of plunder and ill treatment meted out by these Chinese conquerors, and this led to predictable tensions that found release in a string of uprisings and rebellions from time to time. But just as the Sui government was attempting to gather everything up in Yunnan and incorporate that into their empire, they were overthrown. And this was in 618. 
Whenever there would be a change in the dynasty or ruling government, the provinces out on the edges of the empire would often attempt to take advantage of the situation and break away or assert some self-determination. The tribes to the east and northeast of Yunnan, closer to Sichuan, Guizhou, and Guangxi, well, China's gravity affected them more than it did to those tribes' people who lived closer to Burma and Laos in the mountainous west and south of Yunnan. This greater distance made it easier for them to go about their lives without the China government interfering. And actually, throughout the six dynasties, Bai and Wuman people lived peacefully with their China neighbors. The problem didn't really start happening until the time of the Sui and Tang dynasties. From the 600s to the 800s, Yunnan found itself in the unenviable position of being caught in the middle of the two warring empires of Tibet to their northwest and Tang China to their north and east. The history of Yunnan during this time was inexorably tied to these two empires. Right from the start of the Tang Dynasty, founding Emperor Gaozu showed an immediate interest in the southwest and sent officials down there to do some scouting and maybe prospect for alliances. And this was a long-running problem that repeated itself. Tang officials sent down to Yunnan would conduct themselves in such a way and exhibit so much greed and cultural insensitivity, the relationship got off to a bad start. But they weren't all bad. One official was sent down to Yunnan and used more enlightened methods to establish a rapport with the tribal rulers down there. And he was able to establish seven prefectures and 15 counties. And this high-ranking official, he was able to keep everything friendly between the Tang Emperor and Chang'an and the many tribes in the Lake Arhai Valley, where Dali is today. But this period of peace was interrupted in 648 when a new Tang policy was initiated that led to more assertiveness in Yunnan province. The Protectorate General to Pacify the South, also known as the Tang Dynasty's Protectorate in Annan, lasted from 679 to 905. So already in 648 and into the 650s, the Tang court was eyeballing Yunnan at its 796-mile, 1,281-kilometer-long border with modern northern Vietnam. They were also wary of the Tibetan Empire and all their eastward ambitions. And these two reasons alone made Yunnan province very important to China. As Tang soldiers started showing up with more frequency between 649 and 656, they were met with no small amount of resistance from Yunnan tribal armies not appreciative of the incursions. One chieftain among all these tribal leaders in and around the Lake Arhai part of northwest Yunnan was named Xinu Luo. His Mengshe tribe, or Zhao, was located south of the other main tribes of this rich agricultural region. By no means was he the most powerful leader in Yunnan, but Xi Nulo had the foresight to consider the positives of an alliance with Tang China and what that might mean to his future prospects inside Yunnan. And for this reason, some historians consider him to be the Nanzhao Kaiguojin Wang, the founding monarch of Nanzhao, but Nanzhao wasn't formally established in his lifetime. In his time, the name of his land was called Great Meng or Da Meng. In 653, Xi Nu Luo sent a son to Chang'an as a hostage and established relations with Tang China. And he became their man down in Yunnan and ensured the other five main tribes didn't take any military action against Tang forces. And for bringing peace between Yunnan and China and for following all the protocols of a tributary state, Xi Nu Luo was loaded up with honors, titles, and gifts from the emperor. Xi Nu Luo's great-grandson, Pi Luo Ge, became chief of the Mengshe tribe. And with their big strong buddy, Tang Emperor Xuanzong in their corner, Mengshe became the top political entity in all of Yunnan. Tang Dynasty China needed someone they could rely on down there, especially the way the Tibetan armies had been acting. 
and P. Law Ge had long paid tribute to the Tibetans and had fought against Tang armies. But now, beginning in 738, he was a Tang man. And that is the official start of the Nanjiao Kingdom. Get out of the trenches of tedious tasks like managing order fulfillment and start growing your business with ShipStation. They'll help increase profitability by automating your workflow with their simple, easy-to-use dashboard. With it, you can pretty much do everything you need to quickly and easily. Update order information, print labels, compare rates, optimize shipments, and even set up automatic delivery notifications. And it doesn't matter where you sell. Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Shopify. ShipStation can integrate pretty much anywhere online. Another great thing about ShipStation? They can help reduce costs with industry-leading discounted rates from some of the biggest mail carriers. You might even be able to get up to 89% off USPS and UPS rates. So, make this year your most profitable one yet. Sign up for your free 30-day trial at ShipStation.com and use the code SPOTIFY. That's ShipStation.com with the code SPOTIFY. P. Law Ge sent envoys in 732 and 734, and even personally went to Chang'an, paid tribute to Emperor Xuanzong, and said all the right things, and what followed was a nice, long honeymoon period between this newly recognized Nanjiao Kingdom and the Tang Empire. Among the many titles handled to P. Law Ge was King of Yunnan. He was given the Chinese name Meng Yi, and in 745, P. Ge sent his 10-year-old grandson to Chang'an as a hostage. And true to his word, P. Ge's Nanjiao acted as the model tribute state, and while he was alive at least, relations with Tang China remained quite amicable. He used his prestige with the authorities in Sichuan, who oversaw Yunnan, to vanquish all his rivals in Nanjiao. Xuanzong had a lot of hopes riding on this Nanjiao relationship as far as using them to keep the Tibetans in Tibet. But in the 730s and 40s, relations between Tang China and the Tibetan Empire had entered a phase of relative peaceful coexistence. And at the same time, P. Law Ge began rubbing up against parts of China territory. And while he was pressing north, Tang troops were, were pressing southward. Control of Yunnan was going to be critical to their plans in northern Vietnam, and you know, therein lie the rub. Not only were Chinese appearing in greater numbers in Nanjiao, they had done things like you know, muscle in on the salt business, which was a great source of income for many, and to build the roads that led into northern Vietnam, taxes were levied, and local people were forced to perform manual labor. So with relations a lot less rosy than they had once been, P. Law Ge's son took over in Nanjiao. He had territorial ambitions and put much less importance on the Tang relationship than his father. So this ruler, Ge Luo Feng, he reigned 748 to 779. Emperors Xuanzong, Suzong, and Daizong ruling in Chang'an. And here is where the Tang dynasty starts to turn the corner, and not in the right direction either. During the time Ge Luo Feng ruled in Nanjiao, relations with their former Tang ally deteriorated quickly. Then following an incident in 750 that saw Nanjiao envoys manhandled and disrespected by a Tang official, it sparked a rather highly disproportionate response on the Nanjiao side that involved the execution of the official. And that and the steady deterioration in diplomacy brought the curtain down on Nanjiao Tang relations for now. This was quite a provocative act perpetrated by Nanjiao's ruler, Ge Luo Feng. The Tang military had to respond to such an act, and not in a small way either. 80,000 troops were sent north from Annan to attack Nanjiao, but between the mountains and the mosquitoes and other infectious diseases, this attack on Nanjiao ended poorly for the Tang dynasty. And this was followed in 752 with Ge Luo Feng ending their alliance with Tang and switching over to the Tibetan side. And for this, he was given the same array of honors by the Tibetans that these Nanjiao rulers got whenever they switched sides. 
and among the titles given to Ge Feng was the title Eastern Emperor. Two years later, in 754, in retaliation for joint Nanjiao Tibetan attacks deep into Sichuan territory, another, even larger Tang force was sent to destroy Nanjiao, and this one, too, was soundly defeated after encountering fatal logistical nightmares and other problems. So at its inception in 738, the kingdom of Nanjiao had served as a nice, valuable ally for the Tang dynasty. And for a while, at least, Nanjiao had fulfilled its role, being useful in keeping things quiet with Tibet and as a conduit to northern Vietnam. But not anymore. Now these two were enemies, and though the government in Chang'an probably would have liked one more whack at them, in 755, the Anlushan Rebellion kicked off, and that, as we all know, kept the Tang government busy until the 760s. So with China distracted by one of the biggest political crises in centuries, the Nanjiao Kingdom went on a major acquisition spree, invading both Burma and the Tang Protectorate in Annan. The Nanjiao Kingdom had pushed out the extent of their borders during this time and were now in the 8th and 9th centuries, a major player in the region. But a good portion of their longevity had been due to their mastery in manipulating either Tibet or China against each other, for Nanjiao's benefit. In 779, Ge Lofeng was followed by his grandson, Imo Xun. Imo Xun was very pro-Tibet and put a great amount of importance in that relationship. He was the first to sign up when the Tibetan Empire decided to strike again in Sichuan, then called Icho Province, with its capital, of course, in the historic city of Chengdu. This attack on Ijo was meant to be a quick in-and-out operation with low expectations as far as Chinese resistance, but the Anlushan Rebellion had long ended in Dezong, one of the good Tang emperors, was ruling up in Chang'an, and rather than an easy win, the allied Nanjiao Tibetan army was given a shellacking at the Datu River in western Sichuan. And to make matters worse, the Tibetans blamed the loss on the Nanjiao generals' incompetence. And this put a serious damper on relations. So, with a reversal of fortune in the Nanjiao Tibetan alliance, Imo Xun, given this degradation in relations, considered the option of switching sides. And fortunately for Nanjiao King Imo Xun, there was an opening to reconcile with the Tang court. Despite past transgressions, a captured Tang magistrate was able to work something out with Imo Xun, whereby he swore to break his alliance with Tibet and come back to the Tang side. So in 787, ties were reestablished between China and Nanjiao, and this couldn't have happened at a more opportune time. Emperor Dezong and his military planners were right in the middle of strategizing their once-and-for-all takedown of Tibet. Decoupling from Tibet wasn't as easy as Imo Xun hoped. Into the 790s, Tang diplomats tried to pull Nanjiao down off the fence and begin fighting on their side against Tibet. A sizable Uyghur army, allied with the Tang, had already invaded Tibet from the north. The Tang military was counting on Nanjiao's commitment to provide military assistance in this special military operation against Tibet. And it took until 793, but after the Tibetan military had suffered a number of defeats already, Nanjiao finally matched their words with deeds and threw their lot in with the Tang Dynasty. And when it was all over, there followed a period of Nanjiao diplomats bowing and scraping before Tang officials, making excuses for past decisions and swearing eternal loyalty. So in 794, Nanjiao was officially allied with Tang China. And when the Uyghur army was bearing down on Tibet and Imo Xun was called on to assist, he proved his loyalty to his new Tang ally and joined in the destruction of the Tibetan army. And thanks to Imo Xun's campaigns, Nanjiao reached its greatest geographical extent, and they remained a loyal subject of Tang. In 798, the first ever imperially sanctioned thorough study of the Nanjiao region and people was carried out by Chinese historians and presented to the emperor. The battle between Tibet and the 
combined Nanjiao China armies continued on into the final years of the 8th century and into the 9th. When Imo Xun died in 808, he was given posthumous honors by Emperor Xianzong. Despite the rocky start, Nanjiao China relations had been strong. Time and again, Nanjiao proved itself as an ally. His successor only reigned for a year and was replaced by a 13 year old boy ruler named Qinlong Sheng. He was given the royal nod by the Tang court and reigned 809 to 816. And it was hoped that despite all that past acrimony, this time the love was going to last. But by the early 800s, Tibet was no longer the great regional power that they had once been. And besides all that external pressure on Tibet, a succession crisis had led to a civil war and a period of fragmentation. And this ultimately led to the end of the Tibetan Empire, which is usually dated to 842, Emperor Wu Zong's second year, the year he started going after the Buddhists. So without that shared common threat to bind them together, China and Nanjiao soon began to find plenty to complain about. The Tang vision of Nanjiao had been to serve as a buffer and counterweight to Tibet. Now Tibet was neutralized. Though Han Chinese had been migrating and living in Yunnan since at least the Han Dynasty, it was still a place mainly populated by indigenous people, more attuned to what was going on in South and Southeast Asia rather than in China. And though they had their moments... Usually, Nanjiao had been the weaker of the three regional powers contending with each other for two centuries. There were times when Nanjiao was powerful enough to take advantage of the misfortunes that befell the Tang Dynasty or the Tibetan Empire. And then there were times when Nanjiao went on the warpath, playing the role of aggressors. 846 was such a year. That's when raids started happening across the border in the Annan Protectorate. And for the next 20 years, Nanchao forces in Annan ravaged the place, denying the Tang of any of the benefits they had always depended on from the Protectorate. From 857 to 866, northern Vietnam was besieged with horrific fighting and savagery, mostly at the hands of Nanchao soldiers. But in 866, the Tang army was finally able to defeat Nanjiao and put an end to this long conflict and push them out of their Annan protectorate. And following this conflict, the Tang dynasty had only 40 more years of life left in them. Yeah, the rise and fall of both Nanjiao and the Tang dynasty occurred around the same time on the timeline of China history. With relations in freefall by this time and a new ruler named Shirlong on the Nanjiao throne, both sides found ways to antagonize each other. Shirlong, who reigned 859 to 877, went so far as to formally break things off with the Tang and declare himself an emperor. As the Tang dynasty fought for their survival up north, Shirlong continued into the 870s to do battle all over western Sichuan. But in 875, Tang General Gao Pian decisively defeated the Nanjiao forces at the Dadu River, where the Nanjiao forces had once fallen almost a hundred years before to the Tang. So you can see where Yunnan history is concerned, at least. The Nanjiao part isn't a nice, easy, linear history to follow. Besides their non Sinitic tribal culture and way of life, their period in Chinese history roughly 738 to 902, 164 years, was a convoluted one with Nanjiao sometimes siding with Tibet and sometimes with its much larger neighbor to the east and north, Tang Dynasty China. So much has been written about Nanjiao and Chinese official histories and by others from more than a thousand years ago who visited the place. We don't know what language they spoke and from linguistic studies and archaeological evidence, it's guessed they spoke an old Tibeto-Burman language that's no longer around. Despite being a non-Sinitic culture, Nanjiao still fortified its existence by adopting a whole buffet table of Chinese ways, most notably in the organization of their government. Throughout Chinese history, it was common for the kingdoms that surrounded China to send their young people there to learn. 
The Chinese did this themselves during the late Qing, studying in Japan, Europe, and America. And with so many Nanchao princes, other royals, and aristocrats spending so many years in China, Sichuan mostly, it's no wonder that the Nanchao kingdom had a heavy Chinese flavor. The government adopted many of the systems contained in a Chinese Confucian bureaucracy, though it was filled with people from across the many ethnicities of the region. Confucianism was embraced by Nanchao aristocrats and elites, maybe not so much with the masses. They knew Chinese poetry and literature. Nanchao poems could even be found among the 49,000 lyric poems in the Qian Tang Shi, the complete Tang poems, the largest collection of Tang poetry. Buddhism had been introduced in the 8th century by Pi Lo Ge, and it thrived in Nanchao. Nanjiao's Buddhism blended with many indigenous beliefs and rituals practiced in that part of southwest China from time immemorial. In the Dali Old Town, north of modern-day Dali, you can visit the Chongsheng Temple Complex. This temple, including the most famous part, the Three Pagodas, will become much more important when we get to the Dali Kingdom in Part 2. As important as Buddhism was during the Nanjiao period, it plays a much more prominent role in the Dali Kingdom. Chongsheng Temple is one of the top tourist attractions in all of Yunnan and the most recognizable landmark in Dali. The largest of the three pagodas was built between 823 and 840 and stands 227 feet, making it one of the tallest pagodas in China's history. This was built under one of the Nanjiao kings I didn't mention, Quanfeng Yo. It was modeled on the relatively newly built, at that time, small wild goose pagoda in Chang'an, the Xiaoyan Ta, built during the time of Tang emperors Mu Zong and Wen Zong in the 9th century and refurbished following the great Shanxi earthquake of 1556. Nanjiao's architecture also blended Chinese and native styles. They were great carvers, and the adornments they made to their buildings and temples were no less intricate and beautiful than in other worlds. If you stop and think about it for a second, look at all that cultural diversity that was whirling around the Nanjiao Kingdom and greater Yunnan province. Bai, Yi, Dai, Tibetan, and so many others who surrounded Yunnan all the way to India. And the earliest Chinese influences came from Sichuan and even earlier from Chu, an ancient state known as a vast reservoir containing so much cultural richness. A pretty interesting place. Historians and scientists are still trying to figure the Nanjiao Kingdom out. Same with the Dian Kingdom. Like with most of Chinese history from this far back, there's a lot more we don't know than what we do know. The tapestry of this region is so dense and variegated. In the course of my scratching around for material on Nanjiao, I came across a number of scholarly papers whose authors drilled all the way down into the theories about who exactly the people were in Nanjiao. Like I said, popular Chinese history says the Wu Man and Bai Man that emerged from the Tuan Man figured prominently in the founding, but even today we're not sure who these people really were. I'm actually going to stop right here. In part two, we'll pick up with the fall of Nanjiao. Yeah, they went down for the count only five years before the Tang Dynasty up and died after so many dismal years of internal strife. Nanjiao kind of morphed into the Dali Kingdom, and that will be the focus for next time. Still a long way to go yet until we arrive in modern times. I hope you'll stick with the program. I already have a feeling this one's shaping up to be... A halfway decent series. No appeals for donations this time, although I may hit you up in part two. We'll see. By the time you hear this episode, I will have already had my surgery. Nothing serious, but the CHP will be operating with only one arm until end June, early July. Or so they say. I guess I'll find out. Okay, hermanos y hermanas, until we meet again, this here's Laszlo Montgomery signing off from sunny and beautiful Southern California. Please consider coming back again next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.